All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Bible study. We are in our third session on the our talk on the book of Exodus. And before we start uh, discussing our content for the evening, I want to say I hope everybody had a, a very beautiful Christmas holiday with your families. I hope that you had a chance to uh, enjoy uh, some time home with, uh, with your families and that the Christmas celebration was uh, a joyful one for, for you and yours. I wish all of you all as well a very happy and blessed new year. Hopefully, uh, I mean, the bar going from this year to next year is pretty low. So uh, hopefully in 2022, we'll be able to uh, come out a little better off than in 2021. So uh, with that, we'll, uh, we'll begin, uh, I'll, we'll catch everybody up. So last, last week, we uh, continued our talk on uh, the life of Moses as we read it in the book of Exodus. And we talked, started our talk with uh, the, the chapter, chapter three, which was Moses talking to God in the burning bush. And so God calls Moses to be his, you know, his mouthpiece, his, his authority in Egypt, and to kind of do the works that God has, has planned, you know, to be kind of the focal point of the, this independence movement. And we see Moses and God talk at length about what's going to happen and how these things are going to come to pass. And Moses raises many objections. And in the end, God brings uh, Aaron along to help him. Aaron is Moses' brother. And now Aaron is also uh, going to help Moses in this task of uh, liberating Israel. And so uh, God, gives him, God gives Moses several signs that he's going to do to help the people, his own people, the Israelites, believe uh, in what Moses is saying. We talked about the divine name of God, which uh, God reveals to Moses, uh, Yahweh, and um, and now we are just at the very beginning of the contest between the God of Israel and Pharaoh and the gods of Egypt. And so uh, we will begin tonight with chapter seven, and we will discuss the first nine plagues. So probably most of you know there are 10 plagues as we find them in the book of, of Exodus. There's 10 plagues altogether. We're going to talk about the first nine. The last one deserves its own uh, its own discussion, um, but we'll be talking about the first nine today. And what I'm going to do tonight is that we're going to go through chapter seven, um, line by line, which is the first uh, plague. And then we're going to kind of sum up the rest of them. And then kind of, I'll give kind of some general themes and general points um, at, at, after, after that. So we won't go through all of the chapters. We're going to be doing chapters seven through 10 tonight. And um so that's kind of the format that we'll take uh, this evening. So if you have your if you have your Bibles, uh, or if you're following along with the text uh, online, we're going to be in Exodus chapter seven, or you can just listen because I'll be I'll be reading the passages as we get to them. All right. So chapter seven, verse one. Then the Lord said to Moses, "See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet." You are to say everything I command you, and your brother Aaron is to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of his country. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt with mighty acts of judgment. I will bring out my divisions, my people, the Israelites, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. So the, it, the chapter begins with this interesting statement that God makes. He tells Moses, I have made you like God to Pharaoh. So St. Ambrose of Milan, who obviously is a bishop from Milan, um, during the time when the East and West were one church, uh, he explains that the Bible uses the, the name God in three ways. So there's, there are gods in name only, like Moses and the saints. We have false gods the demons, the idols, uh, the, the pagan idols. And then we have the one true God. So Moses is a God in that first sense. He is a God in that, uh, in name only, in that God has given him authority to speak to Pharaoh on God's behalf and to act on God's behalf. So he himself, he's not making Moses into a God. He is just giving him, Moses is kind of like becoming a channel for God's power um, in this process. And so he says, I made you like a God to a Pharaoh. So Pharaoh will now consider you like a God. Um, and almost again, kind of 
tag, tag teams God and Moses the same way that Pharaoh and the gods of Egypt would have been tag teamed as well. Uh, how, you know, Pharaoh considered himself to be a god. As, as all ancient cultures did, they, or they believed that their, their kings and rulers were gods uh, and part of the, the pantheon at that time. So Moses will kind of stand in that same place for the Israelites and for Yahweh. Um, in Christ, in the, you know, in the church, in the New Testament, the divine energies of God will be shared in the same way that now is happening with Moses with all those who believe and are faithful to him. Uh, making us gods by grace. You know, St. Athanasius uh, in, his, in his work, uh, in his writings on, on the life of Christ and uh, the, the impact that the life of Christ has on us people, he says that God became man so that man can become God. So in Christ, you know, we can become godlike, not through our own works, not through our own essence, or, you know, not anything that's from ourselves, but in our union with, with Christ. And we see this also in the scriptures in Psalm 82, verse 6, uh, we read from the, the, the prophet King David, I said, you are gods, you are all sons of the Most High. So even in the Old Testament, we have this idea that, you know, God kind of makes, you know, gods by name uh, through their com commitment and, and love and faith in him. Um, one other note on this little section here, the first five verses you know, we hear that phrase again, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And if you were to read these chapters, chapter seven to 10, you will hear that, you will hear that line again and again. So I just wanted to, I know we talked about this last week as well, but I want to talk about it here too. When it says God is hardening Pharaoh's heart, what that really indicates is that God is allowing Pharaoh to have a hard heart against him. Pharaoh is choosing by his free will to be stubborn and to be prideful and to not acknowledge God and to, uh, to not submit to his will. And God is not making him do that. He's simply allowing him to do that. He is allowing Pharaoh to act evilly because that's, how, that's what God does. God allows mankind to choose for, him, for itself, you know, good or evil, you know, to, to be united to him or to live apart from him. So uh, when we hear that, we shouldn't think that God was making Pharaoh do anything. Um, because if we do, that's, that kind of uh, leads us to the conclusion that God is the one causing evil uh, in the world, which obviously we don't believe. So uh, with that, we'll continue now. We're in chapter 7, verse 6. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded them. Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 when they spoke to Pharaoh. So that's where we get there, the ages of uh, Aaron and Moses. Um, according to tradition and uh, scripture as well. And that's where you get that distinction of Moses was 40 years in Egypt and then 40 years in Midian. And so when now, when we get to this point, where now he's standing in front of Pharaoh, returning to Egypt, he's 80, 80 years old. Uh, I know we had discussed those time frames in earlier sessions. So in verse eight, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when Pharaoh says to you, perform a miracle, then say to Aaron, take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh and it will become a snake. So uh, God is preparing them, you know, now to go in, and stand in front of Pharaoh and to announce, pronounce God's judgments on him. And so he tells them, you know, this, is, it's a same, the same sign that he told Moses to use with the Israelites. Now he says, okay, this is what you're going to do with the, uh, this is what you're going to do with the, uh, with Pharaoh. You're going to take the staff and throw it down before Pharaoh and it will become a snake. Now, uh, it appears here that the staff that is in question, because, uh, you know, in reading this, I was a little uh, confused at first. I was like, why, why is Aaron throwing his staff down? Because obviously in the burning bush sequence, you know, God makes sure that Moses has his staff and tells him, you know, that this is going to be really important. Make sure you have it, things like that. Um, but th it appears here that this is the same staff. This is Moses' staff from chapter four. Yet in this case, it's Aaron who is charged with throwing it down to make it into a snake. Uh, this is the same staff as we read these chapters and go through these chapters that will be kind of the focal point of all the miraculous things that are happening in this book. Um, St. Ephraim the Syrian takes a spiritual approach to the, this image of the staff. He says the staff is a sign of the cross. So it's like a, like a, a prefiguration or um, a type, you know, a type of the cross. It caused all the plagues when it swallowed the snakes, just as the cross would destroy all the idols. Uh, my question in this, in reading this was like, why not Moses? You know, why is Aaron 
why is Aaron the one that's it's, that's you know throwing the the uh, the the staff down to turn it into a snake? And uh, I get in one instance that you know Moses and Aaron are now a team, so they both have to they both have to kind of take part in this process. But also, you know, it, I, I was thinking about this a little bit, and this is kind of this is my own musings. So take it with a grain of salt. You know, I'm, I'm not uh, I'm not Saint Ambrose or uh, Saint Gregory of Nyssa or anyone like that. But you know, as a priest, Aaron is a priest. We'll see that you know later in the book as he offers sacrifices, et cetera, et cetera. And what the job of the priest is is to stand between God and the people, to stand between you know to represent God to the people and to represent the people to God and to make offerings. So that's the priest's job. And so in this case, Aaron is the one that stands between God and Pharaoh. And so it, it's kind of fitting in one sense that Aaron is the one doing that because uh, he's, that's, his, that's his role as a priest. You know, it's, it, it makes sense then that now in this case, um, he's the one that's going to act throwing the, rot, the staff down to turn it into a snake. So I don't know if that's a good uh, reason why, but th that was certainly one explanation that kind of um, came across my mind as I was reading. So now we get to verse 10. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron threw his staff down in front of Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a snake. Pharaoh then summoned wise men and sorcerers, and the Egyptian magicians also did the same things by their secret arts. Each one threw down his staff, and it became a snake. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Yet Pharaoh's heart became hard, and he would not listen to them, just as the Lord had said. So uh, the, Aaron does the sign. Pharaoh's magicians do the same thing, um, trying, trying to like discount you know, the miracle. And then Aaron's staff eats the other snakes, <laughs> eats the others. So it, again, it, it's kind of like the prefiguration, kind of like a foreshadowing of everything that's about to happen. And Pharaoh, of course, is hard as heart. Uh, and he will not listen to them. And so now he is going to bring God's wrath upon him. So we now get to the passage in the Bible where God begins to uh, inflict the plagues on Egypt so that Pharaoh might uh, relent and let the Israelites go. And the Hebrew word translated, you know, that we talk about plagues, the Hebrew word really, when translated, is um, hits, you know, to hit. Uh, like when, when, you know, my son, you know, does one of these and I said, no hitting, that's what God's about to do to Egypt. Uh, so there's, there's going to be 10, there's going to be 10 hits altogether that God is going to um, lay on Egypt. We can, uh, the, the image that popped into my mind preparing for this was that of like a boxing match. You know, God, God is now going to enter the ring against Egypt and it's God's and uh, he's going to begin, you know, fighting. He's going to start fighting back. He's been watching Pharaoh and Egypt beat down his people for all these years. And now he's going he's gonna to start punching back. And there's going to be 10. There's going to be 10 of these hits altogether. Kind of like 10 rounds, like a, like a boxing match. So makes sense. All right, verse 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is unyielding. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he goes out to the river. Confront him on the bank of the Nile and take in your hand the staff that was changed into a snake. Then say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews has sent me to say to you, let my people go so that they may worship me in the wilderness. But until now, you have not listened. This is what the Lord says. By this, you will know that I am the Lord. With the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water of the Nile and it will be changed into blood. The fish in the Nile will die and the river will stink. The Egyptians will not be able to drink its water. So uh, we've, God gave Moses three signs in the beginning. One was the, the staff turning into a snake. The other one was the leprous hand. You remember, he puts his hand in and out of his cloak, and it becomes leprous and is healed again. And the last one was turning water into blood. And so we've seen now, Moses has already shown Pharaoh the first one. And now this was like the emergency sign. This was like, okay, if the Israelites don't listen to the first two signs, then you're going to turn water into blood. But with Pharaoh now, God is, he's, he's showing the, the emergency sign, the emergency warning, you know, that, that God's not messing around and he's going to, uh, you know, make this happen where the water of the Nile and all of the water in Egypt is going to turn into blood. This is significant because water is representative of life. So the fact that this life force water 
uh, you know, which we can't live without, is changed into blood, which is representative of death, prefigures the last and horrible plague that's going to happen in chapter 11, which we're not going to talk about tonight, which is, of course, the death of the firstborns, or what we call the Passover. Furthermore, in Egypt, uh, water and the Nile River was like a god in itself. You know, many of the gods of ancient Egypt were, were water gods, or they were gods of certain bodies of water. And so God using this first plague to attack the Nile was also an attack on these so-called gods, these so-called deities. And uh, as we're going to see here, Yahweh's, Yahweh's going to land, he's going to land the first punch. Uh, Father Lawrence Farley has a nice little book. It's called Walking with Moses. Uh, in, in that book, he adds an interesting note that the Hebrew word for blood was not only used for the substance that flows through our veins, but also to indicate color, i.e. red. So he notes that it could mean that God turned the water of the Nile red, made it really bad smelling and caused it to kill all the fish, but not necessarily into like blood, the substance blood. And he points to verse 21 of this chapter, which we haven't gotten to yet, but in just a few verses, we'll see that the Egyptians won't be able to drink its water because of how bad it smells. If it was truly blood, they wouldn't have even thought of it. But, you know, here they're, they try, but it just stinks. And so they can't. Um, so it's an interesting tidbit. You know, the point to me is that the water of the Nile, which was of the life force of the Egyptian people, was the center of life. It was a, a means of transportation. You know, they used the flooding of the Nile to irrigate their crops. You know, it really meant everything for them. So now this, this life force would now be useless and deadly to them. So God is, is showing them that, He's not messing around. Verse, verse 19, chapter 7. The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the streams and canals, over the ponds and all the reservoirs, and they will turn to blood. Blood will be everywhere in Egypt, even in vessels of wood and stone. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded. He raised his staff in the presence of Pharaoh and his officials, and struck the water of the Nile, and all the water was changed into blood. The fish in the Nile died, and the river smelled so bad that the Egyptians could not drink its water. Blood was everywhere in Egypt. But the Egyptian magicians did the same things by their secret arts, and Pharaoh's heart became hard. He would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said. Instead, he turned and went into his palace and did not take even this to heart. And all the Egyptians dug along the Nile to get drinking water because they could not drink the water of the river. So, uh, you know, what, can, what, what we can't just kind of skip over here is this, this idea that, of how important the Nile was and to lose its ability, to lose your ability to use that, the Nile at that time, you know, would have been devastating for everyday life. And yet, what do we see Pharaoh do here? He, he does an about face and just walks back into the palace like nothing's happening. You know, he's completely unmoved. And so this is a sign of his complete arrogance. He refuses to believe that what is happening is a true sign of, of the God of the Hebrew superiority or that, you know, this God of the slaves could be stronger than he is or could be stronger than the gods of Egypt could be. And he just he just walks out. You know, he just he just leaves. Uh, and he takes, he doesn't take it to heart at all. In verse 25, we read, seven days passed after the Lord struck the Nile. So uh, seven, for seven days, the waters of Egypt were, were blood. So Pharaoh's sorcerers might be able to reproduce the miracle, but they can't get rid of it. You know, they couldn't, they couldn't turn the, the blood back into water. You know, they couldn't make the water usable again. Only God can do that. So that's a summary of the first plague. Uh, and the rest of the for these nine, you know, plagues, plagues two through nine, follow a very similar pattern. Uh, God commands Moses to go to Pharaoh and announce the next plague. Moses goes and demands Pharaoh let the people go, or else said plague will happen. Pharaoh doesn't agree, and so the plague happens. Then there's a scene with Pharaoh, who in the end has his heart hardened and doesn't let the people go. Uh, so instead of reading, you know, through all the different plagues, since again, many of them, can, they all follow a very similar trajectory. Here's, a, here's the list of the, of the first nine plagues. 
So plague number one, we just read, that's the Nile turns into blood. Uh, all the water in Egypt turns into blood. Plague number two is an infestation of frogs. So in that time, uh, it was very common after the Nile flooded, the waters would recede again, and then the frogs would like multiply and come out of the river. So they were used to, you know, frogs, especially in the river area. But this infestation of frogs is like nothing they had ever seen before. There were frogs everywhere. It talks, you know, God warns. And what happens is that the frogs are in the, the palace. The frogs are where they sleep. The frogs are where they eat. They're like covered. The land is covered with frogs. Um, unlike anything they had ever seen before. Plague number three was an infestation of uh, lice or gnats. Uh, and really in, in the Hebrew, it's really just like a swarm of biting insects. So like mosquitoes, think of like just the land being filled with mosquitoes. Uh, sounds pretty terrible. Plague number four, infestation of flies. And not just like one kind of fly, but like all kinds of flies. Um, you know, ones that bite, cause disease, you know, suck your blood, et cetera, et cetera. And by the way, as I was preparing just like an hour ago for, for Bible study tonight, I was sitting peacefully on my couch and all of a sudden there was a loud buzzing sound coming from behind me. And uh, I'm not really afraid of bugs, but I don't like it. I don't like the buzzing sounds. And so I jumped up and there was this huge bug flying around my light. And I was like, oh my gosh, the plagues, the plagues are here. Um, but it was only one and I got it. So, so we're good. Uh, plague number five, plague on the livestock. So God brings a pestilence. He, he makes all the livestock sick and many of them die. Plague number six, plague of uh, boils. Boils are like really bad pimples, but these are more like festering sores, skin ulcers, very painful, very debilitating, uh, not, not very nice. Plague number seven, a horrible hailstorm, like had never been seen before, very destructive. Uh, plague number eight was an infestation of locusts. So um, that whatever was left from the hailstorm, the hailstorm was meant to destroy the crops. So the locust was, the locust came and ate whatever was left. So whatever the hail didn't destroy, the locust came and ate. And then plague number nine was total darkness for three days, complete and total darkness. And God says the darkness will be like, so that they can feel it. You know, it'll be so dark. Um, and it says that they weren't, nobody was able to leave their house for three days because of how dark it was. Plague number 10, as we know, is, is again, the, the death of the firstborns and, and the Passover. That's the, that's the straw that finally breaks the camel's back. But we'll talk about that next time. Uh, so, the con so now some general comments and, and some general themes from, from the plagues. And I invite you guys you know, to read the chapters, to read through them um, on your own. Uh, me kind of skipping over them is not uh, indicate that they're, it's not important to read them. Just for the sake of a Bible study, uh, I found it, I think it's a little more beneficial to, to talk more generally and pick the themes out. So the most common theme of the plagues is that Pharaoh doesn't repent. His heart is continually hardened. And God will use Pharaoh's arrogance to show his own power, just as he uses our own weaknesses to reveal his strength. And we see this in the New Testament in the writings of St. Paul. So in St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12, verses 7 and 9, St. Paul writes, Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. So St. Paul is talking about how he had this, he had something, and he called it here a demon, you know, messenger of Satan, that was tormenting him, something like physical affliction or whatever it may have been. And he says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, this is God now speaking to St. Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So just like we saw with Moses in the burning bush, you know, God will use, you know, whatever you have to offer to glorify his name through you. Um, we shouldn't feel like just because we have weaknesses or just because we have faults or just because we're not perfect, that, you know, we're not worthy in God's eyes, you know, to do his will. And even in this case, God will use Pharaoh's pride and his, his evil hard heart to, to show uh, just how strong he is, which will be very, we'll talk about in just a minute, how important that is for the ancient Jews. Um, some interesting things as, as we make our way through the plague. So by the second plague, which is the plague of the frogs, which happens just, you know, a week after the plague that we just read about with the Nile turning to blood. 
Pharaoh calls after now as the frogs are running rampant, Pharaoh calls Moses back to the palace and he asks Moses to pray on his behalf that the plague can be removed from the land. Uh, so first of all, this shows that the plagues were not a natural phenomenon. It was not something they had ever experienced before. This was totally unusual and supernatural and disturbing and, um, you know, in a way debilitating and just not good for their everyday life. Uh, and the, these, these things are a judgment on Egypt from God and only God can remove them. Interestingly, three chapters earlier, when Moses comes to Pharaoh in chapter five, Pharaoh refuses to acknowledge God at all. Remember, he asks, for those of you who were with us last time, you know, he asks Moses, uh, who is he? Who is, who is the God of, who is the God of the, the Israelites, you know, that I should listen to him? Now, three chapters later, Pharaoh is asking Moses to pray to God on his behalf. Even so, he himself will not go and worship God. He himself will not bend his will and be humble and, and do the will of God. Um, he, but he, at the very least, now is acknowledging, you know, that these things are, are coming from God. You know, and Moses, it's, it's, uh, it's funny when you read in, uh, I believe it's in chapter, uh, still in chapter 7. Um, when Pharaoh makes this request, uh, Moses kind of gives a snide comment. He says, oh, I leave you the honor of setting the time for me to pray for you and your officials and your people, that you and your houses may be rid of the frogs. So he tells Pharaoh, oh, just tell me, tell me when, you know, tell me when you want me to go and, and pray and, and we'll, we'll make it happen. Um, so he, uh, he's kind of in that way, he's like kind of taunts Pharaoh a little bit there. Um, showing that, you know, it's God is the one who has the power to, to bring these plagues and the, and the power to remove them, even though Pharaoh is not willing to recognize it totally yet. Yet. In each case, and every time Pharaoh asks Moses to come and pray, every time that Pharaoh, uh, you know, he says, uh, I have sinned, he, in the end, he always changes his mind, and he does not allow the Israelites to leave, again and again, over and over again. So as the process continues, we even see Pharaoh start to negotiate with Moses and with God through Moses. So at first, he offers, he says, you know, I'll let, the, I'll let you guys go to sacrifice, but only within Egypt's borders. Uh, he says, okay, you guys can go and sacrifice, but only the young men, not their families. Uh, he offers for them to go into the wilderness, but to leave their livestock behind. And all of these really are like, again, he's trying to like negotiate so that the people won't leave and not come back. He's trying to keep them in, in captivity, which is in direct opposition to what God is trying to, what God's request is really about, which is freedom. At one point, he even tells them that they can leave. You know, he, he says, I have sinned. Um, you know, he says, I have sinned. And, uh, you know, my God is, your God is righteous and I'm, I'm evil. But even then, when he says that, he's not, he's not sincere. He's not, he's, not, he's not giving an admission of doing anything wrong, but only that he didn't give God his due respect as a legitimate deity. So... In each plague, again and again, he's not willing to humble himself and fully submit to God's will. And this ultimately will be his downfall. Uh, St. John Chrysostom notes that humility is the beginning and end of salvation. And we see that, we see the opposite case in Pharaoh. Uh, Pharaoh wants to take what God wants, which is for his people to be free and substitute something else. And this can in no way be acceptable. You know, there's no, God does not, you know, God does not negotiate. Um, we, as Christians, have to take this to heart as well. You know, when we discern God's will for us in our life, we can't compromise. You know, when we read the scriptures, then we, you know, go to confession and we have spiritual direction placed in front of us, and we can't we can't compromise. We have to accept and work diligently to do those things. And we'll talk more about that as we uh, in a little bit. So by the third plague, the infestation of the, the biting insects, the lice, gnats, mosquitoes, whatever, whatever it is, Pharaoh's magicians are no longer able to replicate the miracles. So with the blood and with the frogs, his, his magicians were able to do it too. But 
and by the third one, they're no longer able to do that. And in fact, they come to Pharaoh and they tell him, they tell Pharaoh that these things are happening by the finger of God. So even the, you know, even Pharaoh's servants by this time are understanding that all this calamity is coming from God's hand, you know, the God of the hand of the God of Israel. And so we need to take this seriously because he's winning. He's beating us up, you know, at this point. And yet Pharaoh continues in his blindness and uh, he stubbornly, you know, snubs Moses and the Israelites over and over. During the seventh plague, we have a similar thing, you know, where some of Pharaoh's servants hear the warning of the hailstorm. That's the seventh plague. So Moses comes into the palace. He warns everybody that this is going to happen. And some of the servants, you know, take him seriously. And they go to like bring in their servants out of the fields to bring their livestock inside, you know, their livestock inside to protect them. Because obviously a devastating hailstorm, if there's people outside or animals, could kill, kill, you know, it could result in loss of life. So, um, so, they, so they listen and they, they take it seriously, but, but not Pharaoh. Um, even though some of his own people are starting to understand, uh, some act on it and some take it seriously and some don't. Um, all of them have the opportunity to cultivate this faith, but only some did. And that's why we hear in, uh, in, in Proverbs chapter 9, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So the, the people that feared the Lord showed wisdom in acting and bringing in their servants and their, their animals out of the fields, knowing, what was going, knowing that God was going to bring destruction. And so that, that fear of the Lord resulted in a wise decision. Um, this is true in our own spiritual life as well. So we are going to have in our life many opportunities to answer God's call and to come to know him in faith. But it will be up to the state of our hearts, open or closed, you know, soft or hard like Pharaoh, you know, how we're going to answer. The spiritual life is a process of softening the heart and opening our hearts to the, to the very presence of God himself and to his will. Father Lawrence Farley I'm going to quote him directly here. I thought, I thought this paragraph was really important in his writings. Although as Farley, he writes on this, on this topic, you know, he, he compares us to Pharaoh and how many times we refuse to do God's will. But he writes that our refusal, and I'm quoting now, our refusal to submit to God is not couched in terms of refusal, but of silent and unacknowledged negotiation. And we talked about this just a minute ago, about how Pharaoh tries to negotiate with God and how this is unacceptable. So he's, so Father Lawrence is saying that when we, when we reject God's will, it's usually not an outright rejection. It's usually in that we try to do this process of negotiation and, you know, offering a little bit, but not the whole thing. So now I'll continue, Father Lawrence. We believe, for example, that all of our time is our own, and we decide for ourselves how much of it we will give to God. Bargaining a Sunday morning in exchange for a religious checkmark or good standing. We might believe that all our wealth is our own and decide for ourselves how much of that we will give to God, perhaps a small contribution to a charity every Christmas time. Because God is God and because our happiness depends on our constant communion with him, God demands all, all that we are must give to him. Uh, to sum that up, partial obedience is not obedience, it's disobedience. There's no such thing as negotiating with God because, or at least there's no good resolution to negotiating with God because the only way that we can reach eternal life, the only way that we can experience the joy and peace and life of the kingdom is through complete obedience. That's the only way. There's no, there's no alternative. You know, there's no, we have to be obedient to God's will if we want to be if we want to live eternally. Uh, C.S. Lewis sums it up very beautifully. He talks about the judgment and he says that at the end time, I'm sure I've said this before. I, I quote this all the time because I find it so profound. Uh, he says that um, in the end, either we will tell God thy will be done or God will tell us thy will be done. So in other words, either we will submit ourselves to God and allow him to save us or God will see our pride and our unwillingness to, you know, humble ourselves before him and say, okay, have it your way. And that will lead to destruction, which is really like literally what we're seeing happen now in the book of Exodus. All right, some more, some more themes. By, by the fourth plague, which is the plague of the, the flies, the biting flies, uh, the swarm of flies, I should say, 
Moses makes it clear to Pharaoh that these things are only happening to the Egyptians, not the Israelites. So uh, this is to raise the contrast, so to speak, to show the difference between the Egyptians and the Israelites, as well as the gods of Egypt and the gods of the God of Israel, the one true God. So Pharaoh's gods may be the gods of Egypt, but they are not the God of the Israelites. They are not the universal Lord of all heaven and earth. Again and again in these plagues, God attacks and overwhelms the so-called gods of Egypt. We already saw this in the first plague, right? We talked about how the Nile was like a god in and of itself and how the water god, you know, there were different water gods and how God, you know, completely does whatever he wants. You know, he turns all the water into blood. In the second plague, you know, the frogs were symbolic of the fertility gods of ancient Egypt. And so again, God overwhelms and defeats Egypt's fertility gods. And in the fifth plague, he strikes down the, the livestock, which, you know, the, the livestock in ancient Egypt were worshipped as deities. And here God afflicts them with sicknesses and many of them die. In the sixth and seventh plagues, God destroys their crops and their harvests, which again had their own gods that were in charge of the harvest and of the, the flooding of the, the fields, et cetera, et cetera. And God completely defeats them. And in the ninth plague, God defeats the sun, the sun God. You know, he brings darkness on the land. Um, and so God defeats the, the sun God, Ra, who is one of the most important uh, Egyptian gods. Interestingly, this is, we don't find this in scripture. We find this in holy tradition. Um, when Mary and Joseph uh, flee, which we just heard the story last week, when Mary and Joseph flee uh, Bethlehem to go to Egypt, to save the life of Jesus because Herod was, you know, killing the, the innocent children from that area. When they go to Egypt, um, tradition states that as they were passing by the pagan temples, the pagan temples were crumbling to the ground and were completely destroyed as, as they were passing by. Why? Because this same God that is humiliating the gods of Egypt in the Exodus story is that little baby, you know, is that, is the, is that child, you know, being taken to Egypt now for his safety. Um, so I, I thought that was a nice kind of the next step of the story, right? Jesus returns, Jesus goes to his Egypt or returns to Egypt in one sense. And, um, the, the idols and the gods are still crumbling before him. Uh, St. Gregory of Nyssa, one of the Cappadocian fathers, he believes that the Israelites were not afflicted by any of the plagues and that they were so unaware of what was going on that they had to be notified of the travails of their Egyptian neighbors. Uh, and this is clear in the ninth plague, which is the plague of the darkness. So in chapter 10, verses 22 and 23, I'll just read those couple of verses there. So Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky and total darkness covered all Egypt for three days. No one could see anyone else or move about for three days. Yet all the Israelites had light in the places where they lived. Um, there's another in the plague of the, the pestilence of the livestock. Uh, Pharaoh actually sends out his, some of his, you know, some of his officers to go and check if the Israelites were suffering the same way. And they come back and tell him that no, nothing, that nothing has happened to them. And so it's clear that, you know, the Israelites are fine. They're, nothing has changed for them. And yet the Egyptians are being totally tormented by these plagues. Uh, St. Gregory continues and he makes the point. But the experience of these plagues were so different for the Israelites and Egyptians, even though they lived side by side because of the disposition of their hearts. So Egypt itself, Pharaoh and Egypt in this book are representative of, of evil and a life of sin. Uh, for those who are sinful, for those who live apart from God, the end result is destruction, just as Egypt is destroyed as a result of these plagues. Um, you know, when we don't know the one true God, we live in total darkness. Uh, you know, in contrast, you know, we have coming up very shortly, the Feast of Theophany, a Feast of Epiphany, the Lord's Baptism in the Jordan River. That's the Feast of Lights, Don Photon in Greek. Why, do, why is it called that? Because God reveals himself as Trinity for the first time. God makes himself known as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so God is light, absence of God is darkness or rejection of God because God is never absent, but we can shut, shut the windows, so to speak against them. Um, and this concept of darkness would have been really powerful for the ancients because, you know, they didn't have electricity. 
um, you know, when it got dark outside, they were in their homes. You know, when it got dark outside, they were, they were home. They were not fond of the nighttime. Nighttime meant vulnerability. It meant danger. Uh, you know, it meant locking your door and waiting for the sun to come up. Uh, nighttime was like the time of death. So for, you know, this imagery connecting darkness and sinfulness uh, would be very powerful, especially for, for the people living in the ancient world. You know, for us, like here, it's, it's 7.45 at night. It's been dark outside for three hours. And yet it's light, you know, here because we have all this electricity and, you know, we go in our cars and our cars have lights and we can get around no problem. So now it wasn't that way back then. Uh, Israel, on the other hand, is blameless. You know, they didn't do anything wrong to be made, in, made slaves here. And they experience blessing in life. You know, they're untouched by all this. And eventually they will be freed from their, from their captivity. Uh, yet, what do we see? And we'll see later on in this book when they go into the desert and they make the golden calf and they worship it. They suffer and they die, just like the Egyptians do in this, in this book, in this part of the book. So, um, so that's really important that, that the Egyptians and the Israelites have very different experiences of, of these plagues. It's not by accident, and the deeper meaning is the connection between a sinful life, a life without God, and where it leads us, and a life with God, and where that leads us. One leads to destruction, one leads to life. Okay. So these plagues, next, next point, these plagues are not only like a nuisance. They're not just like annoying you know, it's like, I remember like uh, some years ago, remember when the cicadas, it was like the year of the cicadas and the cicadas were everywhere buzzing around and just, it was just like annoying, you know, like you'd find them in like piles in certain places. They had all like half of them had died all at the same time. Uh, it was just annoying though. It wasn't like destructive. It wasn't, you know, at least from, you know, my experience, it was, it was not, it was just annoying. That's not what's going on here. These plagues are meant to destroy Egypt. They are a judgment. They are a judgment on, on, on the land of Egypt. So we hear in the fourth plague, the, the plague of the flies, that Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's advisors come and say the whole land has been ruined by the flies. When their livestock and horses were attacked with pestilence, it affected their transportation. It affected their military because their military, part of their military was cavalry, which had used horses. It affected their agrarian economy right? Because they used animals in their farming. The one that when the water they drank was turned into blood and made impotable, that was devastating for them. You know, that would have been very difficult to overcome, even for a week. You know, they had a hailstorm that destroyed all their crops. And then the locusts came and they ate whatever was left over, which would have incited a, 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 a famine in their country and would have caused the deaths of a lot of people. Even the plague of the boils, you know, uh, would have made it impossible to move or work without pain. And, uh, and we already talked about what the darkness, the three days of darkness did to them. They weren't able to leave their homes for three days. So the plagues were completely debilitating. So what does this show for us? This shows that God's power over Egypt is total. There is nothing they can do except humble themselves and submit to God's will. That's the only rational solution to Egypt's problems right now. And before the seventh plague, so we get the first six plagues, which is through the, uh, through the boils. No, yes, through the boils. So after, after everyone's been afflicted with boils, which sounds awful, God, you know, God warns Pharaoh and he tells him, if you continue to be stubborn, I'm going to unleash my full force against you and you will be cut off from the earth. So uh, God warns him sternly and sincerely and says, you know, I'm not, I'm not messing around. And even so Pharaoh and Egypt do not, they do not repent. So what this little episode shows, you know, when God tells Moses to go in and tell Pharaoh, you know, I'm going to unleash all the plagues on your heart. This shows that up to this point. So for the first six plagues, God was holding back. He wasn't, he was not using his full force against Pharaoh in Egypt. And Father Lawrence Farley writes, Pharaoh was not still standing because Yahweh could not overthrow him, but because Yahweh had been patient. Pharaoh's survival was not a testimony to Pharaoh's strength, but to Yahweh's restraint. And I just, I just loved that, the way that he put that. You know, that, that God actually in those plagues you know, could have made it much worse. You know, that God could have completely just destroyed them in one foul swoop. Um, 
but he hasn't. He's actually been showing restraint, but these last four plagues are the harshest and they're the most destructive. Why, um, why doesn't God just, you know, boom, just, you know, take them out all in one, all in, as we say in Greek, all in one. Uh, it's because he wants to use this, these plagues to humble Egypt before the whole world. And so that the Israelites will know forever that who God is. Um, but we'll talk about that in just a second. I have one more point before we get to that. So just the way, same way that God is patient with Pharaoh here, even though he's afflicting him, he shows patience and restraint. God is patient with us too when we sin. And he calls us to repentance, just like Pharaoh. You know, he calls us to not be hard of heart and to repent of our sinfulness and to live. And he's patient with us. But in the end, there will be judgment. Even for us as Christians, like, you know, we believe in the end that there will be a judgment, you know, that the judgment is coming. There's a very um, indicative icon of Christ. And uh, maybe I'll share it when I post the video link. I'll, maybe I'll share it on there. Um, there's a very indicative icon of Christ that depicts, it's like called the two faces of Christ. So one is the merciful side. So like this side of the face is like the merciful side. And this side of the face is the judgment side. So like if you cover the face of Christ, this side looks very merciful and serene. And then when you cover this side, it's, it looks very judgmental. Um, so that's, 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 the rea that's a reality for us as, as Christians. You know, we, we believe in the resurrection of the dead. We believe in God's love and mercy. But if we have hard hearts like Pharaoh, then in the end, there will be judgment. Which again, as we talked about for us, is God, uh, God submitting to our will to be apart from him, which, which is death itself. You know, being apart from God is death. We could have a whole nother Bible study just on that topic, but um, just to connect to that point there, you know, that Pharaoh, God being patient with Pharaoh, God is patient with us, but the time will come when, you know, our life ends and we'll be standing in front of Christ and then we'll be judged. So as I mentioned, you know, God uses these plagues and God continually again and again and again and again and again brings these plagues on Egypt to show the Israelites and to show the whole world, but mainly to show the Israelites for all time. And in every generation, just how strong their God is and how easily his will is accomplished. So these stories will be told again and again to help the newer generations of faithful know the Lord. Uh, you know, these are the stories you know, of, of God afflicting Egypt and turning the river into the Nile river into blood and sending upon them the, the locust and the hailstorm and the darkness and, you know, the Passover, et cetera, et cetera. These are the stories that will connect the people of Israel, the newer generations. And we'll see that a whole generation dies in the desert as they walk to the promised land. A whole generation dies. This whole generation that leaves Egypt, they all die. And we'll talk about that when we get there. And so this new generation that wasn't there to witness all these things, how will they stay connected to God through the stories of everything that is happening right now? Um, you know, they will know what God has done for them in the retelling of these events, that God is the one true God and that he has chosen his people. And um, the same thing goes into the church. We as the church are the continuation of Israel. We're the new Israel, the new Jerusalem. And so we do the same thing. We remember and we recount and we tell the stories of the great works of the Lord. And we, in the church, we do it every year through the feasts. You know, we just had a great feast, on December 25th, every year. We celebrate the birth of Christ. Um, you know, that's, uh, that's a fixed celebration. And every year we hear the stories. You come to church. If you come to church for the royal hours of the nativity, you hear all the gospel passages about the Lord's birth. You know, in the Vesperal liturgy, you hear the Old Testament passages that refer to the Lord's birth. And then you hear the more gospel passages and the, the epistle readings. And, and we recount and we remember in icons and hymns and re in scripture, all the things that the Lord has done. We have another great feast coming up shortly, which is the Lord's baptism, epiphany. And again, the same cycle will start. And we have those fixed feasts. You know, we have, we have the celebration of, of Pascha. We have uh, the Palm Sunday. We have the Lazarus Saturday. Uh, we have... Um, you know, the presentation of the Lord in the temple. Uh, we have, 
the Evangelismos, March 25th, the Annunciation with the Virgin Mary. And these things are celebrated again and again and again. These stories are told to us again and again and again. And in doing so, by participating, just even by going to church, right? Even by attending the liturgical services on those days, we become witnesses of those events. We become participants. It's like we're there, you know, it's, it's like we're seeing those things happen with our own eyes. Um, and that's why the liturgical life of the church is so critical. And in many of the hymns of the church, and many of the, especially the feast day hymns, they start with the word today, right? Think about Holy Friday, Holy, Fr Holy Thursday night, excuse me, Holy Thursday night, as we're reading the 12 gospels. We, at, at that point, after the fifth gospel, I believe it's the fifth gospel. I'm in Christmas mode, not, not Lent mode yet, but we're getting there. Um, we come out with holding the crucified Christ, right? The church is darkened. We come out, we bring the Christ out of the altar, and he's on the cross. And what does the priest say? Simeron cremate. Today is hung on the wood, right? Simeron cremate pixilu. Today is hung on the wood. He who suspended the earth upon the waters today, right? The word is used is today, simeron, today. So when we come for those services, it's, it's like we're there. It's like we're witnessing it happening again. Um, you know, in the nativity, the feast of the nativity. Um, no, it's the feast of the, oh, I forget, simeron tisoterias, evangelismos. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm tired. It's, it's been a long week after, after Christmas. But again and again, we hear that word, simeron, simeron, today, today. Everything's happening today. Everything's happening right now. Um, it shows that in the life of the church, we aren't just telling stories of things that have happened in the past. We're telling stories that are happening now. You know, we're telling stories that are relevant today in our lives, that touch our hearts and um, that we're able to experience in our own ways, um, even today, 2,000 years, almost 2,000 years later. All right, so that's, that's the plagues. That's the first nine plagues. The, the big one is, uh, that's number 10. That's the knockout punch. That's God's knockout punch, the, the, the death of the firstborns. And we will talk about that next week. All right, at this time, are there any questions? Feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question and fire away. You guys tired too? I get it. Totally get it. All right. Thank you all. I appreciate your time. Thank you for being with us and uh, uh, continue to uh, pray for us as your priest. Pray for your church family. Pray for our, our nation that we can continue making our way through this uh, pandemic so we can see some normal days soon. Happy New Year to you all. God bless you all, especially those who have uh, celebrating their names days coming up, Vasily, Siliki, Vasilias. Um, God bless you and your families always, uh, and especially as we enter into the new year. Thank you all. We'll see you.